Key points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Feds, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Kira Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And today we have with us author Robert Farrell. And unfortunately, I'm in it. Well, unfortunately, I'm at a hotel, a week of Paw Hotel, uh, and we just finished with the International UFO Congress, where we had... Oh, several, we had four or five days of movies and speakers in the extraterrestrial UFO disclosure experiencers world. But today's guest, or and today's guest, is the incredible Robert Farrell, who we've had on before, but he's got a new book. Before we bring on Robert, and I'm going to have him tell our listeners about himself, uh, what would you like to say, Dr. Lesson? Well, a, a few things. Uh, first of all, of course, yeah. Bob, I, I absolutely love what you do. Bob Farrell gives us, uh, Robert, I should be formal, Farrell gives us a wonderful science fiction, award-winning science fiction that went right to number one in science fiction, and you get all involved in the story, and then he comes out with a companion book, which is the scientific engineering facts upon which his fiction, or was it fiction, uh, is based, and, you know, uh, Robert is a, Professor, retired professor of engineering, so he can explain and he can explain this stuff in simple uh, form that any intelligent person that just listens step by step can get it. How uh, it's it's totally wonderful. I love his work. But before he gets into the actual work, since he's been at this conference with us, uh, Robert, I'm going to ask you when I, when you think of this conference and. What would turn you on, or what's most salient to you in terms of your learning and the uh, cutting edge? What comes up for you? In regards to this conference? Yeah. Yes, yes. What did you like? What did you learn? What things oh. are revolutionary? What, uh, you go ahead. Give us your thoughts and impressions. Uh, well, I think the one that really was the talk that was most meaningful to me uh, was Swanson's talk on the uh, torsional uh, part of the universe. I found that fascinating, and it really, because I lecture on, um, I, have a lecture, I have four lectures, and one of them is called the um, <clears throat> Gravitational Field Propulsion, colon, Key to Interstellar Travel. And in that lecture, I present a number of uh, peer-reviewed papers on work that's being done in the laboratory to uh, create gravitational fields and, and do experiments related to gravitational fields. And they get rem- remarkable results, but uh, the papers are kind of uh, are at a loss to explain actually why this happens. And Claude Swanson's uh, explanation, uh, I think this was two days ago when he gave his talk, uh, I thought was wonderful. I bought his book, and uh, so now I'm going to try and uh, fold in his, uh, his concept uh, as far as how gravitational fields are created into my talk. So I, I see so how myself... Does, how does... Uh-huh. How does he I, think uh, and how do you think gravitational fields are created? Well, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. It, it was a little bit complicated. Oh, okay. and, 
and I have to digest it and convert it into a layman's language uh, because you know he uh, he he's he's got a couple degrees, one from MIT and I think one from Princeton, uh, and it, and it was a, a good talk. Uh, but I haven't. I don't know how many people in the audience really understood uh, the the totality of what he said, and I want to digest that before I try and uh, summarize it. Uh, but it, it has to do with, uh, 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 I guess you would call it precession. You know, like when a gyroscope precesses. How uh, yes. uh, this toy gyroscope, you get it spinning, and then eventually it's, the axis starts precessing, and. Uh, mm -hmm. And he has some equations related to that, but uh, so so matter in general, uh, if it's spinning uh, or in a, a type of a spin, and, and uh, the axis precesses somehow, uh, th this seems to create a gravitational field. And he gave some some okay. really wonderful examples. Yeah. Wobbles work. Wobbles work. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, by the way, I, I, the first thing I really wanted to say is I think today is Janet's birthday. Is that correct? No, it was February sixth. But yes, I am an Aquarian. <laughs> oh well, my uh, okay. My facts are wrong. Anyway, okay, well, a related <laughs> birthday anyway. <laughs> I well, won't ask how old you are. Yes. You you look like you're about oh, twenty five, but I I know you're a little older than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I am uh, sixty two and proud of it. I made it. A lot of my friends didn't get this far. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I'm 76, and I know I have even more friends that didn't get this far. So uh, right. uh, we should we should count our blessings. But I, I, I thought the, oh. the uh, of course, this is the world's largest uh, conference, and and people from all over the world were there. I went, I, I went into the um, session where uh, it, it, it's uh, people come to the, into this session. They usually have the very first thing in the morning. They call it the experiencers. Uh, and they talk about their experiences with UFOs and all that. Uh, but there were people from England, people from um, uh, just just about almost well, not every country in the world, but yeah. all over. What's that? There were a lot of people from Australia. Yes. A couple from uh, South Africa. It's just an amazing. Oh, Brazil. I, I just met people from countries yeah. all over. I wonder how many, there were probably at least two, 3,000 people there. So we're, it's like five, six yeah, days, I, including the, uh, the film festival, which we should touch on a little bit. Um, go ahead. What were you going to say, Bob? Sorry. Uh, I also, I, I had someone stop by my table who was from uh, Israel. So I don't know if he gets the ah. award for traveling the farthest distance. I suppose Australia <laughs> probably gets the award. <laughs> Oh, There's a German fellow, too. Oh, German fellow. Yeah, I, I saw the, the fellow from Israel. So uh, I saw you a couple of times. I like to go to the experiencers uh, section of the conference. What did you think of some of the stories? They were incredible. Yeah, in actually, I, I went uh, this morning. Uh, I got there a little late, but uh, because uh, I had some questions that occurred to me in, in my science fiction writing, uh, I, I try to be as accurate and uh, try and represent what I consider the consensus of the uh, ufologists on the subject in my book, in, in my science fiction books. And uh, one of my main characters, in fact, she is my main character, Dr. Wendy Ahern, um, she, she has an innate ability to translate just about anything that's written. But also, uh, she, her mother had trained her as a classical pianist and had a dream that that's what she would do. Well, she didn't go that route, uh, but she has a, really a love for music. And in fact, uh, one of the scenes I have in, in the story, she ends up uh, in, uh, playing a duet with, um, uh, I don't know if I should mention his name, um, but I, yeah, he plays a violin and he's a ufologist. Some people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Tim, Tim Good, okay, I'll go out and say Tim Good, except I didn't call him Tim Good. But in my mind, it was her and Tim Good playing green sleeves, and it brought me oh. to tears. Yeah, and, and it, I don't know if you've ever been to. Uh, they have a lot of times when you go to UFO conferences, the speakers have a uh, a room, you know, where they just get together by themselves and chat, and and so that's where this occurred. And it was a suite, and they had a piano set up, and uh, ironically, because Wendy plays a piano, and Tim was there, of course, with his violin because it's so expensive, he never wants to leave it out of his sight. But uh, <laughs> and and so they ended up doing that. But what this when I went to the thing this morning, um, 
I wanted to ask because when uh, Wendy and Corey, my two characters, and uh, they they went aboard an uh, alien craft. Uh, they weren't abducted; they were taken there because there was some need to. But uh, and as much as I like like as much as Wendy liked music, I didn't think to put music into those scenes, and I wasn't even sure if if there is music aboard a UFO. So that was one of the questions that I raised when I went there. The, this morning, I asked the the people that were there. There's what well, maybe a hundred people anyway. I said, "Does yeah. anybody recall?" Huh? Say again. There were about a hundred people there. Yes, I'm yeah. fifty-three. There were about a hundred people there. Yeah, and uh, so I raised the question uh, because a lot of them have been aboard craft. I think they were abducted for whatever reason, and uh, I was amazed. And some, oh yes, the the music is wonderful. Uh, and they can't describe how it's made. In other words, it doesn't sound like any instruments we have, but it's beautiful music. It's very powerful music. And that was good. That was good feedback to me. And somehow I think in my next book I'm going to make that known that uh, aliens really do have music. They love music too. And I did make that statement in one of my books. Quell and my alien was asked, you know, what is it about humans you like? And he said, well, one of the things I like about humans most is their music, beautiful music. So – uh, but I never had him playing music, you know, like you go into uh, a doctor's office in the waiting room and you hear this music. Um, right. Uh, I never have him doing that, but I think they will in the future. So that was interesting. Well, and they, then uh, they had him playing music and singing songs on Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry introduced that very early on because Michelle, Michelle Nichols was a uh, fine, uh, what do you call it, uh, singer. So go ahead, Sasha. Go ahead. Oh, just in the Anunnaki literature, they specifically say that Nigashita, uh, the, the son of the, their chief scientist Enki, deliberately gave uh, the uh, people of Sumer uh, music and musical instruments and trained people. Uh, and, and music is one of the gifts. And in the music itself was coded much mathematical wisdom. Right, and they had... Wow. Um, and, and string instruments and, you know, so I think that, you know, the ancient aliens had music. Uh, well, they did, yeah. In fact, uh, in the, my latest book, uh, Noah's Flood, uh, I, I was talking about the Sumerian culture, and I have some um, photographs of some of their artwork, and, and, and one of them is a harp. It looks like a harp. That uh, right. I, don't know if, I think uh, Sir Leonard Woolley probably was the one that recovered this uh, from a grave, and, but it's beautiful. Uh, so they, obviously they had music then too. Yeah, we can stir to ecstasy, the living liar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Well, then uh, did you see the discussion between uh, Dr. Robert Jacobs and <laughs> Barbara Lamb? I'm not Robert Jenkins, uh, David, David M. Jenkins, probably oh, you're Robert, and Barbara Lamb, and they had Yvonne Smith, and who's Joe. Name? Joe, Joe what, Joe? Uh, yeah, this was a fantastic uh, yeah. to, uh, let our listeners hear a little bit about what the context of this is. Uh, yeah. uh, several <sighs> hypnotherapists on the panel were saying uh, what the content of what they were getting, and, and whether it was uh, positive and supportive of the contactee, or whether it was traumatic and uh, terrible. And basically, uh, it became apparent to me and other uh, thoughtful people that people were getting exactly what they were looking for, that a positive attitude uh, therapist, namely uh, Barbara uh, Lamb, was getting very, very loving and positive reflection, even on events that seemed uncomfortable like anal probes in the beginning. Uh, as the person became uh, more mature, they started seeing it was part of a bigger process and help, uh, where they are winding up with a mission of, of helping humans. And, of course, some of them even enjoy the anal probes. But in any case, you could see that each uh, – the, the, the one fellow that, therapist, I won't say who it was, who was terribly fearful uh, and thought the uh, contact experiences were uniformly frightening, was a person who was uh, frightened. Well, I yeah. think that Dr. Jacobs, uh, someone else pointed out to me, and then I'll pass the baton to you, that um, Dr. Jacobs early on published his findings, though they were more positive in the beginning, but he had a certain uh, basis for his theories on what was coming through his clients, his patients, 
and that got published. So that probably further influenced the individual patients for choosing Dr. Jenkins over perhaps Barbara Lamb or or the other, you know, John Mack. So he started to get more and more clients of the same genre <laughs> with the same story over time. And his conclusions were that uh, basically the gray aliens were doing a hybrid program. They were going to take over the world <laughs> eventually. They were they were just changing the planet for their own uses. But Barbara Lamb, who has another point of view and, and is more softer and her approach is more feminine, has these hybrids that are coming out. And she actually had six hybrids on stage with her. Did either of you see? Yes. Uh, did you see that? I, I saw I saw the the panel discussion. In fact, I was one of the few people that actually had a chance to ask questions because, unfortunately, they, they didn't have time for many. But I, I was might have been the last one that asked questions, and uh, because I wanted uh, I a lot of what I know about uh, hybrids that I put into my books, my science fiction books, uh, I, I gleaned out of uh, D- uh, David Jacobs' work. And uh, he, because in the, the threat, the book called The Threat, he he goes through uh-huh. the, all the, the various steps and iterations that it takes to end up with what you might call a, a, a real human, a full term human. And and he, I don't recall in that book that he ever said what happened on that last step, whether they were allowed to go full term. And it was I just assumed that they, that was true. And then, so I asked the question uh, at, at the thing uh, at the conference. Uh, directly to him first, but then I wanted to hear what the others thought. Uh, it was my impression that that last gen, uh, iteration that that hybrid was allowed to go full term, be born into a family of two parents who don't even know, maybe they don't even know they've been abducted, but as far as they're concerned, it's a normal thing. The child is born but has a kind of unusual characteristics, you know, certain capabilities, and very talented, smart, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, but but no one, the, the child, nor the parents weren't aware that the child was a hybrid. And uh, the reason that was important to me is because um, because uh, uh, Dave, David thought that, that these hybrids were more or less trained, you know, to, and, and then allowed to come into our life for the purpose that he thought might not be good for us. But if indeed they were allowed to go full term, in my mind, um, then they, what they, what they're really doing, the, the aliens are really doing, is ratcheting up humanity to another level, and I didn't see yes. that as bad. You know, I, I didn't see that as a bad thing. Right. Um, right. But so, I so, you know, heartily. <laughs> what's that? I agree with you. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't read any of his recent books because uh, he started getting so bad, so dark. I yeah. read The Threat a few years back, and at the end of that, I was like, okay, I don't think yeah. I want to go there. But he was a delightful man. But oh, yes, he yes. He was so opposite yeah. of my research, and uh, I work with yeah. a lot of experiencers, and they, in general, have positive experiences, especially at the experiencers group. There yeah. wasn't very many negative uh, encounters that I recall. But, uh, yeah, in my direct uh, contacts with uh, some of the Anunnaki and their representatives here uh, in the present is that they have uh, are committed to our uh, evolution. They are your Quinlan in your books. They are here to help us. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, when... Uh, you know, David gave his, his own talk too. This is before the panel discussion, uh, and I, I remember he he was saying how he didn't understand how they managed to have their gowns. You know, they, 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 when when people be abducted, they'd see these uh, hybrids or at various stages, but they all had uh, like gowns. You know, like a, a medical the hybrid nurse. gown. Yes. Yeah, the hybrid <laughs> gown. He, he said, "I wonder where they get yeah. those." And I wanted to jump up. Tell, I, I was going to jump up when if he had Q and A, and tell him I knew where they came from. But he didn't have time for Q and A, so I went over to his book signing table and I said, "David, I, I've been studying this, and I know where they get their gowns." And he said, "Where's where? that?" China. Ah. 
Well, where do they get those silver cables that everybody goes on? I wonder where that factory is. <laughs> well, uh, I bet it's in China. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's it's not in the China. U.S. anymore. <laughs> we, we used to make yeah. them, but, but we couldn't compete with China, so. <laughs> Everything is in China now. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, did you get to see any of the movies, especially the two ones that won? Uh, I did not. I uh, I chose to commute. I only live about an hour away from where the meeting was, and uh, uh, I'm on a low budget here. So uh, and I have a car that, that gets like 48 miles to the gallon. In other words, it costs me a gallon of gas each way. So I chose to commute. <laughs> and uh, wow. uh, so I, that, the bad thing is I didn't get really a chance to to mingle, you know, with with the people afterwards, and I didn't get a chance to see the movies because, uh, you know, I was tired by the end of. Uh, 6:30 was I was ready to go home. <laughs> oh, these conferences are marathons, that's for sure. I get yeah. exhausted. I heard someone say, "Well, I got my 2 hours of sleep. I'm ready for today." <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe in my younger days I could do that. But uh Oh, this was an old an old man. I was laughing. <laughs> was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, really? Was, okay. Oh yeah, he was a senior just what it goes and uh, yeah. he said, "I got my 2 hours of sleep. I'll set to go." <laughs> Anyway, you didn't say that very loud. So anybody else that stood out in your mind before we shift to other subjects? Uh, well, other of course, uh, for- I, I think one of the highlights was that uh, they, they got Jacques Vallée uh, to – Yeah. To, uh, we, that was almost like a panel discussion, I guess you might say. That he, he and um, – uh, um, I can't remember his name now. Leo um, – Oh, yeah, let me get it. I'll get it. Let me yeah. here. So they're the both of them up there on, on stage and uh, talking uh, re- and reminiscing. Spiegel. Yeah, Lee Spiegel. Yeah, right. Lee Spiegel, Nick Pope, Meryl Cook, and Ron Western were the panel. But Lee Spiegel and Josh Belay did a presentation. I saw yeah. most of it. I don't think I watched the whole yeah. thing, but I saw most of it. I didn't see the panel, but I did see uh, Lee Spiegel and Jacques Belay. Uh, Belay. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I guess, uh, Valet's, uh, feelings about the matter probably haven't changed too much from years ago. My, my understanding uh-huh. is, uh, and, uh, I'm not sure I agree with his assessment, but hey, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's the way it is. <laughs> so, yeah, I know you sent me some talking points and I just, I think I may have gotten on, but... Uh, we didn't really go over who you are, your bio. Uh, can you oh. tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself? We'll go, we'll back up and then we'll go forward. I mean, we'll yeah, this is fascinating and how a, a novelist takes things from uh, his life and uh, weaves it into this into the story. I think it's totally fascinating what you've done. Well, that's sometimes sometimes it's the only way we could say the, uh, this information, get it out there because. Uh, there's still a potential of, you know, losing your jobs and shame and, and sometimes getting uh, hurt and, and losing your life, you know. It's yeah. not completely, or not completely out of the woods there. Well, uh, okay. uh, so I, I feel I'm safe uh, because I'm writing science fiction. They aren't going to come and get me for that. Plus, the way I look at it, what can they do, make me go back to work? Because I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm not, wor- yeah. I'm not worried about getting fired. <laughs> Uh, so you want me yeah. to tell you a little bit about my background? Um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and about kids, too. About what? Your kids. About your kids. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, uh, I should say uh, all the characters in my stories are people I know, and the, the main character is my daughter, Wendy. Um, and uh, I probably gave her, uh, added a few things as far as what she's capable of doing in the story. Uh <laughs> As compared to what she really can do, she, she does say can that. She uh, fly my, my, or anything? What's that? Can she, can she fly or something like that? What, what actually oh. abilities? Is she telepathic or what, what can she do? No, no. Uh, she is sort of a linguist. Uh, and in fact, that's. Uh, and Wendy in my uh, books is a, is a linguist. You know, she can translate anything. She hates flying, though. Uh, not my daughter, but the character, because her parents were killed. <laughs> Um, but uh, my daughter does say she can order beer in five languages, so that's 
you know, that's one oh, attribute she has. <laughs> And and she is she is uh, she can speak many languages, but, but as far as translating things uh, that are written as my character does, uh, she can't do that. But uh, when I describe her, you know, visually and physically, what she looks like, I'm I'm really in my mind describing my daughter. Uh, and every every character uh, is based on people I know. And I have probably been in almost every scene. Uh, there is one scene that takes place in Las Vegas in a hotel. Um, in, in my second book, and uh, and they, when they look out the back window, they can see the airport. And uh, looking down, you can see those planes lined up, uh, Jan Air planes, you know, that fly people out to wherever, uh, Area 51 right. or whatever. And my characters see yeah. that because I've seen that. that. Isn't that yeah. Jan's airline? Yeah. Airline. yeah. Yeah, Jan exactly. Air, I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, it is uh, – the story is really I, – I, I bring in my own experience, uh, and I told you about when uh, Wendy was playing a duet with uh, Tim Good. Um, yeah. I, the, I actually have uh, – Wendy and I, my, my daughter and I, I, I was at a conference in Eureka Springs, and uh, we were invited to go to this uh, suite, you know, for uh, – to kind of – unwind and there was music there and there was pretzel and stuff and son of a gun if Tim Good wasn't there and uh, so that's where I met Tim so you know so I kind of related to that and so I put that scene in my book and that's so that's how I kind of developed my stories I I pull out things that I've done and experienced but uh, so I don't know if you want me to tell you about my background is that what you want well yeah but I think you should mention your son too Oh, uh, well, we lost our son. He was 17 uh, when he was in a car accident, so it was a number of years ago. Um, his name was Corey, and uh, in honor of him, I uh, the second most important character, his name is Corey also. He's an astrophysicist, and eventually, now this is weird, uh, Corey and Wendy get married. <laughs> so my daughter, my, my real daughter, is, is not too happy about that, you know, marrying her brother. <laughs> But anyway, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't believe in it. What's that? What are some of the topics? What are, what are the names of your books? And then we'll okay. go into. Well, my science fiction book. Yeah, I have, a, it's a, I have a science fiction series and I have a, a nonfiction series. The science fiction series is, uh, is Alien Log, and that was the very first book, Alien Log. And then the sequel to that is Alien Log 2, The New World Order. And the one I just came out with uh, in November is Alien Log 3, The Dulce Affair. Then I have um, the uh, sci- the non-fiction series, and, and the title always begins with The Science Behind. And they are developed out of lectures that I give. I give PowerPoint lectures. I have four lectures that I've been giving um, over the years, and the first one was The Science Behind Alien Encounters. That is now a book. Then I also have a lecture called The Science Behind Noah's Flood. That is also a book. I have a lecture called uh, The Science Behind Creation of Our Universe Without a Big Bang. That will be a book. That's the next one coming out. And uh, the fourth one is... uh, uh, the Science Behind Creation of Gravitational Field Propulsion, Key to Interstellar Travel. And that's where I mentioned Claude Swanson's uh, talk and his book that I bought, I think will be important to me to, to refine that lecture and eventually uh, put it into my book. So those are the books I have so far. And they're all uh, available, they're, they're all available as uh, e-books. And uh, paper books, they're not all available as paper books yet. Uh, Bar- uh, Barnes & Noble and um, Amazon don't have uh, um, the Alien Log 3 yet. But you can, the e-book is available. All my books, the first thing I do is put them on as e-books right off the bat. Yeah, that seems to be easier to do an e-book first. That gets it started, and then people do their, uh, their other books. So... Let me ask you, what is the what's the book that you want to focus on? Uh, well, I'm most excited. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm most excited about uh, the um, 
the, the nonfiction, the science behind Noah's Flood, because uh, it, it kind of blew my mind by the time I finished it. I, 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 my mind was blown. I, I started off... Uh, uh, a, what kind is of the science behind Noah's Flood? I'll ask that question. <laughs> what, what is it? What is, uh, what is the science behind Noah's Flood? Yes. Okay, well, that's a long story, but um, it, uh, in a nutshell... And, and I have to say I spent a whole chapter discussing Zechariah Sitchin, but one of the things that Zechariah Sitchin said, and, and by he has his work has influenced me, but one of the things he said was that he felt the, the Noah's flood occurred about 13,000 years ago as a result of uh, a biggest tsunami that was created as the ice um, sheets, not the sheets actually, the 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 uh, well, there, there are sheets. The ice sheets began collapsing into the uh, Indian Ocean and created the mega tsunami. And that was really what caused the flood. It was a mega tsunami. And I've, in my book, I'm, I'm focusing on Noah's flood, the one in, in the Old Testament, because there are a lot of flood stories around the world. Um, but that's that's the one I'm focusing on. And, and I kind of was led to research that deeper because I was interested in what Zachariah Sitchin said. Now, and most of, I imagine most of your audiences have, have read his books. The Twelfth Planet was the one that influenced me most. And he wrote that in 1976. He said a lot of things about what he thought the, um, the Sumerians knew in their culture and what they believed. And he was criticized uh, by the mainstream scientists because first of all he didn't have a PhD secondly that was not his field of expertise uh, but he did the research anyhow just to satisfy himself I think but I spend uh, like I said a whole chapter uh, bringing the, the last 40 years of science that have, have occurred since he wrote his book showing that everything just about everything he said in the 12th planet is true in regards to uh, how humanity came about in regards to um, uh, this this rogue uh, planet that wandered into our solar system, when when he wrote that book in '76, I don't think anybody really knew too much about rogue planets. Well, now we know they exist. We, we've actually detected them. Um, and, and of course, in the news very recently, uh, like a month ago, there was a lot of buzz going on in, in the astronomical uh, societies about, you know what, we think there might be another planet out there, a big one, you know, two to ten times the size of the Earth uh, that's been disturbing some of the uh, uh, minor planets. And, uh, duh, maybe they should read Sitchin's book. <laughs> In fact, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I really would like to get a copy of Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, out to the scientific community. Uh, and I think they would be amazed, and they'd save a lot of time because – if they just start off with what he says and, and go from there, I, I think we'd get we'd know things uh, sooner. But um, yeah, he generates a, a lot of hypotheses about uh, water in space, water on Mars, why Uranus is tilted, a, a bunch yeah. of things that whether the explanatory system is uh, uh, accurate or not, it gives us hypothetical constructs that, may, that allows us to make predictions and see whether. The hypothesis can be uh, verified or no. Right. Well, uh, in, in regards to, let's say, just talk about Nibiru for a minute. Um, he, he claimed that uh, it had an orbital period of 3,600 years, and, and that number shows up as a char, if you would, that, uh, that's a, yeah. as a measure of time, dates, um, and other things. But um, so – that's the orbital period, and he also says that it, it, it came in and interacted in, in our asteroid belt, so the assumption is that's what they call the perigee, the closest approach to the sun. If you take those two bits of information, you can actually calculate what the orbit looks like, and I've done that. So the, the extreme distance uh, of Nibiru then would be uh, 400, approximately 470 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance the Earth is from the sun. So 470 times as far from the sun as we are. And uh, Sitchin tried to relate the close approach of Nibiru to major events in human history. Um, and so, it, for instance, if we assume that the, the birth of Christ was a major event, you know, that whole thing, uh, then, then the, Nibiru was close during that period, and uh, that was 2,000 years ago. So that means that Nibiru now is way out there on its way back in, and the the orbit by way by the way uh, is quite eccentric. 
So if you look at a drawing of it, it's probably aimed straight toward us almost as it's coming in. So it is going to be hard to see because, you know, uh, astronomers, when they're looking for bodies out there, the planets, uh, the, they'll take a picture uh, with their telescope and then they'll take another one a little later and they, they overlap them and blink them and, and they, they see what moves in the picture. Well, I'm not sure they would see Nibiru move very much right now because I, it's probably inbound. Now, somebody asked me at my table, well, when do you think it's going to get here? Well, if it's true, he won't get here for another 1,600 years, so I'm not too concerned. Uh, well, I did you, talk- you know, uh, uh, Robert, yeah. that, uh, there's a theory uh, that uh, Andy Lloyd and others have been saying that it, at the what's called the, the Lagrange point, 180 degrees and, uh, from wherever Nibiru is on its orbital uh, journey, there's debris from the collision uh, uh uh, that is always remains at that distance from Nibiru and that some of the disturbances in the Earth have been caused not by Nibiru itself, which Lloyd says is now in Sagittarius, like you say, basically at uh, the opposite of, of, of perigee, far away as possible, and that, that what passed through, for example, that may have um, stimulated uh, Earth damage from time to time are meteorites and comets in that 180-degree Lagrange uh, area. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware of that, but that sounds that sounds reasonable. Well, it's consistent with your uh, your hypothesis yeah. that there's an alternate uh, arrival, uh, time of arrival here for Nibiru. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing I was uh, I was always thinking about, well, uh, so the it, the, it takes 3,600 years to complete a circuit, uh, how long is it, uh, let's say, inside the orbit of Jupiter, where uh, it would definitely be visible? And uh, so I, I did some calculations or approximations, I should say, using Kepler's uh-huh. laws. And it, it looks like it would only be inside the orbit of, of Jupiter for about four years. So uh-huh. it's kind of interesting because it, it, in my book, it ends up, in, at the, toward the end of my book, tying this whole story into Gobekli Tepe. Because uh, I believe that's about in that general area uh, uh, is uh-huh. where Noah came aground in, in uh, northern northern Syria, just just south of Turkey, perhaps. And then he, uh-huh. uh, Noah, Noah, and his family and whatever survivors would have headed for high ground and wandered into what's called the Plain of Haran today, and ended up in the northwest corner of that plain to to, uh, to create and, and found. A, what is supposedly the oldest town, and that is uh, San Leorfa, or also known as Urfa. And um, uh-huh. now, uh, Sir Leonard Woolley, originally back in the 20s, 1920s, uh, went to Ur, which is in southern Mesopotamia, to, to do his dig because he was convinced that Abraham came from Ur. And so was I yeah. at the beginning of my book. And uh-huh. he, that's when he dug and dug and dug and got down about 41 feet and found this, this silt and said, well, wait, this, this is evidence of a huge flood. Because before he did that and reported that, people thought this whole story was just a story, you know, a kid's story. And and he's the one that actually got people thinking that it was a serious uh, event, that it actually did happen. Um, but anyway, uh, in, early on in, in my lectures, when I, sh- I show that, I, sh- I show Abraham, for instance, uh, with his, his, whole, his family and everything, migrating up into uh, the plain of Haran and then back down into Canaan, and it never made any sense to me. Why would they do that? But if indeed Abraham was born in Urfa, which is in Turkey, um, then they would have left Urfa and and started toward Canaan. And, uh, you know, because this is like 14,000 years ago in my mind, these people were hunter-gatherers, and they hadn't really domesticated animals or, or uh, created any crops at that point. So they probably walked a lot, and uh, they got about in the middle of the, the current plain of Haran, and, and supposedly um, Abraham's brother, Herod, uh, died for some reason. And so Terah, the father, decided, well, we're going to stay here, and this is going to be known as Herod. I'm, I'm surmising this now. Um, and they stayed there for years. In fact, Terah never left. But eventually, uh, when Abraham was 75 years old, 
uh, he had a calling. Now, this was polytheistic society at that time, but Abraham now got a calling from his God to go into Canaan. So he took Lot, who was the son of, of Haran, and he went into Canaan. Now, if you plot that, that path, that makes a lot of sense. Plus, I understand that if you went to uh, Urfa and you took a tour, uh, they might take you right to the cave where they claim Abraham was born. Uh, wow. Another thing, um, in the um, Orthodox Jewish faith, they they mention it's mentioned that um, that that Abraham spent some time in the house of Noah and in the house of Shem, Noah's son, to be uh, trained and educated on the history. Remember now, uh, well, you may not know it, but it wasn't until about six thousand years ago that uh, people could write things and record history through writing. And so everything was passed down through oral tradition, you know, maybe chants and things like that. But it was oral tradition. Uh-huh. So, so Abraham was educated by Noah and Shem. And, and, and if Noah was like a, a, a day or two days walk away where he was living in the headwaters of the Euphrates River. And uh, so and the time frame, even though Abraham was, is ten generations later, if you look at a table, and this is out of the Bible, if you look at the table uh, and you you assume that, that the date is surrounded, it, it, it takes place 14,000 years ago, and you apply that to this table that you get out of the Bible, you would see that, indeed, um, Noah was still alive during Abraham's life. And Abraham could, he would have been able to go and chat with uh, Noah and, and, and Shem. So... Uh-huh. And, and that, so that kind of supports what's in the Bible, but uh, uh-huh. and there's other other things. You know, I, I I put in these stories like the Atrahasis, which is a flood story, uh-huh. and that's followed by the Epic of Gilgamesh, which occurs was written later. But it's the same story, but it, it's some some there's some changes. You know, in Atrahasis, it's the gods who. Um, who, who knew the flood was coming, and you know you can understand that if they were the uh, Anunnaki, they were very technical people. I mean, they had the capability to, to travel from one planet to another. Uh, so they were probably studying the Earth, and they knew that uh, this warming period was coming, and that it did come, and that what the result was going to be that these huge glaciers, eight miles high, that were along the eastern edge of the Antarctic, um, eventually would be collapsing into the water. And uh, tsunamis and mega tsunamis are the result of energy that's put into the water. And the energy can come from uh, glaciers falling into the water. It can come from an asteroid or, or comet hitting the water. It can come from a displacement of tectonic plates. In this case, it was this huge eight-mile-high slab of, of mass that began cascading down into the water. And, of course, the, the, it shook, I'm sure it shook the earth and, and probably triggered... Uh, earthquakes over uh, in Iran and you know along the uh, area that we, we now call the Persian Gulf, and mm-hmm. but anyway, uh, I, I suspect that the uh, Anunnaki would would know this was going to to occur, and they had a problem that they couldn't solve, and that is overpopulation because when they created humanity, um, humans lived a long time before the deluge. Uh, if you look at the ages of everybody, starting with uh, Adam supposedly. All the way down, they everybody lived to be a 900 and something. If you didn't live to be 900 and something, there was something wrong with you, you know. So they all lived yeah. long, long life. Noah, Noah himself lived to 950. Well, then after the deluge, which is kind of a measuring time, uh, after the deluge, people began to live shorter and shorter lifespans. And in Atrahasis, one 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 theory is because you know these stories are not necessarily complete. Because they're, they're uh, composites of, of evidence that's discovered around different cities and things in that area. And the people who write these books, you know, have a tough job. They piece it together and come up with a consensus. But uh, one thought was that um, maybe um, it, because the, the flood really didn't do the job. I mean, Noah survived and who knows who else that maybe this was where they went in and started doing some genetic engineering again and uh, tweaked our genes so that we would begin to age faster. And that's why we progressively, generation after generation, after Noah 
live a shorter and shorter lifespan, all the way down to Moses, who, who appears 10,000 years later, according to my accounting, and he only lives to be 120. Abraham lived to be 175. So but people were living younger and, you know, shorter and shorter lifespans. Um, and, but Gobekli Tempe is a key part of this whole story because it overlooks the plain of Haran, and the date of the uh, archaeologist dates it at around 12,000, maybe even 14,000 years ago, you know, years old. And I would imagine Abraham being a Sumerian originally. I'm not Abraham. I mean uh, Noah being a Sumerian uh, uh, originally came from what was Samaria. Uh, and they worshipped 12 gods. That was their, uh, the number of gods they had. They they would have built temples eventually. And and clearly Gobekli Tempe, Tepe is a, a temple. And yeah. the interesting thing is that there are four what they call enclosures, the rings, and they uh, they have ten columns surrounding two co- two major columns in the middle. And the, something that I found interesting is these of these four enclosures, all of the main columns are facing generally southeast. Not all not uh-huh. all are the same. They they vary a little bit. And uh, I, I would suspect if Sitchin, and maybe he did see this, I don't know, but it, I'm going to put words in his mouth, he would say, well, they're facing southeast because they're waiting for the appearance of Nibiru, who came out of the southern sky. Uh, that, I'm surmising this now, but it makes sense to me. And the other thing I just recently was thinking about, um, if, if uh, Nibiru is only viewable to them over a four-year period and each year, because we're going around the sun, uh, the appearance would occur at a slightly different location. Maybe that's why there's this slight variation in the, the actual direction that, that these columns are oriented at. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out for some uh, yeah, well, research. Uh, they say Hancock was saying that they actually would move uh, the stones around, the ones that yeah. could move anyway, the smaller ones, to keep adjusting to uh, the uh, changes. In, in where the bureau appeared. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so that all fits, and that's the thing. The thing that blew my mind when I was done with the book is uh, it, it all fits together. You know. Um, yeah. And, I, and I'm, I was amazed. I, that, that's why I, that that is the book that I'm most excited about right now. Yeah. He, he talked about um, uh, yeah, what I liked about the book is you considered all the uh, hypothesized. Um, uh, where did they get this flood story and that story and how come there's this uh, uh, evidence of a comet or this em- evidence of, a, of an asteroid bit and, until you bring it down to the one that you thought was probably the most likely. Yeah. Oh, another bit of information, and it's in my book. Uh, th- I have a picture that I got off of a uh, 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 the internet. Uh, someone had drawn, drawn in, in different colors, three different colors, the three nations of Noah's Noah's sons. We have Japheth, uh-huh. we have Ham, and we have Shem, and they they colored the map in three different colors. And so clearly, you can see there's only one location where all three of those colors come together, and that's at Gobekli Tepe, supporting the idea that somehow Noah is involved in Gobekli Tepe, you know, he, mm-hmm. he and his descendants. Um, and then there's the issue of um, where, when we began creating uh, farm, you know, farming and uh, uh, learning how to create our own herds of animals and things like that, uh, where did that occur? And the general consensus is right about where Gobekli Tepe is, and then it spread out, probably following uh, the, the lines of the three uh, nations. I, I call them, you know. The, but uh-huh. so it just everything fits together, and, and it really should. I mean, if it's if it's if it's for sure, it, if it's right, it fits, and it does. Great. And how, how did he get all those animals? Uh, uh, were they all within five miles of his boat? How did he do it? What do well, you think of all that stuff? Well, you know, I, I, so when I when I was thinking, I said, okay, uh, Noah was a hunter gatherer, fourteen thousand years ago. What is it even possible he could build a boat? 
and I researched that, and um, th there are there is a scientist I don't recall his name. I think he works at the Smithsonian. I'm not sure who did research that, and he claims that uh, people could build boats 18,000 years ago, uh, and they looked like kayaks. And he thinks that uh, that's how uh, the, the people arrived in Greenland from North North America, from uh, uh -huh. uh, like um, England and, and the Northern Europe. There, they went across. Uh, in these kayaks because they could build those kind of boats. And then, um, so the, I have a picture of that. I said, when people come to my table, I said, you want to see what Noah's boat, boat looks like? But also, I've been doing some more research, and, and I've updated that. They, they found a, a tablet, and I believe it was in the British Museum, and it was just sitting there all along, and finally somebody translated it. It is actually a description of, of, of Noah's Ark, of how it's constructed. And it is a round boat constructed with ribs and covered with uh, some material. I can't remember if it's skins or what. And then pitch. You know, they seal everything with pitch because they did have oil there. And by know. humans. Like, by that's humans, a, yeah. That's a petroleum. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and there's a picture right. of a boat uh, that supposedly – it's a round boat and there's people in it. Um, but it was the kind of boat that uh, – Herodotus apparently described when he was in Babylonia uh, 2,500 years ago. He described the same boat, smaller scale though. So I don't know that wow. uh, Noah really put many animals in there, and, and it, I never did. I always had trouble with that anyhow. But in one of the uh, early myths, and I don't know, I can't remember. I think it might have been Atrahasis. Um, Noah was instructed to put uh, seeds of life, whatever that means, into the boat. And you know maybe maybe they're talking about genetic material. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, a lot of unanswered boat. questions. A round uh, boat. When, yeah. You, uh, when you you say round, does that mean that it had no particular front or back or? Right. It was like. The, it looks like the picture. It looks like the inner tubes. Well, almost like an inner tube. You know, I used to sit in an inner tube when I was a kid. You know, back then, you, you, cars had tires or they had inner tubes and you could make them into a float. But it's round. It is round, don't, but it's not a donut. It's it's round, um, and you know you can get inside of it, and it floats. Hopefully. <laughs> wow, it, it reminds me of the coracles that the uh, people used to come over to the British Isles and to Ireland. Exactly. That's exactly right. They, that's right. They they have been described as coracles. I didn't know how wow. many people knew that word. But, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, then there was a story that uh, Gilgamesh encountered Noah and his wife, and that was yeah. how many like a thousand years later, and that they were still alive, and there was a plant that they were eating which helped serve them, so they remained young enough to be alive. Did you well, hear that one? Nobody? Yeah, that's the second story, and uh, yeah. Uh, in uh, tablet number 11, Gilgamesh goes on a quest because he'd heard about this man up in the Pishtim. It's easier to say Noah, but we'll get we'll, we'll call him up to Pishtim. And uh, he found him in the headwaters of the Euphrates, which is why that's what I think where he really was. And um, yeah. uh, up to Pishtim tells him about the story, why he was granted eternal life. And he relates to the fact that uh, uh, Shurpak at that time was already an ancient city when the flood came, and um, yeah. and he was he was uh, told uh, by uh, uh, Spock. I call him Spock. You call him Enki. I call him Spock. <laughs> <laughs> he was a yeah. science officer. Uh, anyway, in a securitous way, he was he was it was not made known to him that this flood was coming and he should build a boat, and um, so uh, and, and so he ended up saving humanity, if you would. And he was, and that's how how come he was eventually granted eternal life at the end of the story. Uh, Elil or Enlil uh, granted him eternal life as a result of saving humanity. Uh, but I, 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 in my lectures, I like to joke. I, uh, a lot of people that come to, to listen to my lectures actually remember Bill Cosby's monologue. If you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> no. <laughs> Where, huh? His monologue. No. Is it, tell me about the monologue. Well, uh, and I think this this monologue maybe made Bill Cosby famous. Uh, it was on uh, 
it, I think it was in the 60s. I'm, I'm going to say 60, 1962 maybe. He did a monologue, and, and he was uh, pretending to be Noah. And so Noah is uh, outside his hut or house, and all of a sudden he hears this voice from God, and the voice says, Noah. And, and uh, so Noah turned, oh, hi, God, what's up? Noah. Yeah, Noah, uh, I have bad news. Uh, there's going to be a really bad flood. And uh, the good news is I think you can survive, but you have to build an ark. Oh, well, well thanks for warning me, um, but what's an ark? And so, <laughs> so uh, the God, God explains what an ark is and how to build it and so many cubits and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, uh, so you know, you wonder, well, did Noah really know how to build a boat? And that's what led me into researching and, and finding out, yeah, they could build boats. I mean, uh, they lived on the Tigris and Euphrates River uh, at that time, and uh, there was there was water, and so they they obviously obviously must have had a way to to go out into the water and fish and do whatever they wanted to do and and transport goods. Um, so yeah, they could build a boat, and, and I just just described what the boat probably looked like. But I don't think he he put elephants and tigers and two of every kind of animal. That evolved in the next story that appeared in the Old Testament. And uh, so, so the story evolves. The original story is the gods knew the flood was coming and and, uh, and and humanity was saved anyhow. But they were hoping that humanity would be destroyed by the flood, but they weren't. Then it evolved into a story where the gods created the flood. That's the, one of the epic of Gilgamesh. The gods actually created the flood. And then it evolves into a story where the gods, singular god. Okay, there's our music telling us that okay. we're going to be off for three minutes. We'll be back okay. Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, you'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side, and soon you will be talking with your angels. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Aloha and welcome back to the Sacred Make Tricks on Revolution Radio at freedomslip.com. And I'm your host, Janet Kerr Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And we're interviewing author, researcher, historian, <laughs> fascinating storyteller, Robert Farrell. But before we get back to our show, I'd like to remind our listeners to please go over to that donation button on freedomslips.com, www.freedomslips.com, and make your donation. A dollar, ten, fifteen, twenty-five, whatever you donate, a hundred, would be greatly appreciated. We do thank you very much for your donation because your donations 
allow Revolution Radio to bring you wonderful shows like ours, <laughs> The Sacred Matrix with Janet Kara Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. And before we bring back Robert, I'd like Dr. Sasha, or Dr. Sasha would like to talk. Yeah, so we're we're following this, the variations uh, in the uh, story of uh, Zia Sutra uh, or Noah, and uh, well, the question that comes now to where we've gotten in the, in the story is what happened to the boat? Where is it? Was it on Mount Ararat or where someplace else? What what kind of what did you consider? What did you come up with? Um, well. First of all, I, I don't imagine after 14,000 years there's much left of that boat if it was just made out of uh, <laughs> uh, skins and whatever. Um, but I think uh, the the tsunami, mega tsunami, carried Noah and any other survivors that managed to jump in the raft at the last minute. Uh, north Northwest, following the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, and uh, he probably would have come around, depending on how high the tsunami was, would have come aground, uh, in the, ironically, in the area. And, and I looked at a topographical map to, map to come up with this, but it looked like maybe not too far from where the, uh, the, the, the de facto state of ISIS is right now, and that's scary. But uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. now, so as uh, one and Willie described, he said that uh, the flood probably was about 100 miles wide and 400 miles long. And by the way, when I say Whoa. flood or, or, or I talk about a mega tsunami, uh, in my book and, and in my lecture, I, I show the photographs of the tsunami that occurred in Japan after the, uh, that uh, in uh, 2011, I think it was, as, because of the uh, earthquake that occurred off the coast. And I, I showed people, I said, now, if you notice, it's a, almost like a surge. It's not this, and it could be a big wave, but, but it's like a, 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 a continuous water just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And that's the way I visualize it is, uh, the, this, this huge, it's, it's not a cresting wave necessarily, but it's a, a hundred foot wall, uh, uh, the sea level rises about a hundred feet, I think, during this period of time. But, wow. but the, the, the mega tsunami, uh, the energy generated as this is can you you can imagine the the mass of this ice that's cascading down, releasing this energy, and that energy travels through the water very fast uh, below the surface. In fact, if you were probably on a boat out in the Indian Ocean, you wouldn't maybe notice anything different. But when it gets to shore, it climbs up, and uh, so it would it would climb up and 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 ironically. If you look at a map of Antarctica, and and uh, you you see that generally the the ice sheets more or less, uh, if you had to pick a point or a vector that that represents the general direction, it's on the 60th um, longitude. And you follow that longitude, and it reads, leads directly uh, to the Straits of Hormuz. And so this oh, yeah. energy would have been directed in that direction, went up. Uh, into what was then a lake, actually, because uh, 14,000 years ago, sea level was uh, about 370 feet lower. And if you look oh. at the soundings of the Persian Gulf today, uh, the deepest points aren't much more than 150 feet. So it was actually a lake that, that probably went down through a ravine that, that became the, the Straits of Hormuz due to the, to the uh, mega tsunami. Into the Indian Ocean, and it was a lake. And uh, I have I show a map that shows it being fed by four rivers. You know, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Pisan, and um, I can't remember the other one now, but they're in the Bible. The Gehan. The yeah, Gehan. exactly. And uh, and that's in the Bible. And um, so that's the, that was the situation at, at the time when the flood came, and it would have carried them up to the region I just described. Now, while they're in this boat. As Willie says, the, the people in that region would have thought it was a world flood, because if you've ever been out on a boat, you get more than about three or four miles away from land, and you don't see land anymore. The, the whole world is covered right. with water, and that's what Noah would have thought. Now, as he as he got up into that region where he came aground, Mount Ararat is seventeen thousand feet high, and you could see that over. You know, it would be a, it would probably stick up out of the the horizon if you looked in that direction he would be looking kind of uh, mm-hmm. northeast and he probably saw the peak of Mount Ararat 
uh, and because it was only like two and a half, three, 300 miles from where he came aground. And uh, mm-hmm. so, so 17,000 feet would probably stick up and you would see it. And maybe that's how the, the, the idea of Mount Ararat came in. Uh, I know it says something about Mount Ararat was covered with 20 feet of water. You know, that I don't believe that. That's a lot of water, and I don't think that there's that much water in the planet Earth. So uh, I think that might be an exaggeration. Uh, wow. Uh, the Gahan, I, I would just like to say from what I, my reading was as wide as our Mississippi. It was a huge river, like a, a mile wide, and they found it by ultra-sounding uh, 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 and finding this uh, place, the bed of this river. And, of course, when there's a tsunami like that, it follows up the lowest uh, areas, and that's where rivers flow. Yes, that's right. So um, there was something else I meant to throw in on this particular segment of the discussion, but I, I, I'll have to try and remember what it was. Um, but anyway, it'll come to me. Well, it's about where the where the boat is most likely. Even if, let's say they used Mount Ararat to and see which direction they were going. Where is it likely that this boat came uh, came down, and where did how did they uh, establish their life right after that? Um, well, I I believe they went into the plain of Haran. They would have headed north uh-huh. into Turkey. And and uh, and I mentioned Gobekli Tepe, it, which overlooks the plain of Haran. It is only about a hundred miles, maybe less, from where the uh, capital of ISIS is down in Syria, and that is the real scary part because uh, I'm sure everybody understands the aims of ISIS is to destroy history, uh, and uh, that is to me the greatest sin. I mean, it's bad enough that they kill people the way they do, but to destroy history is really bad and. And uh, I would imagine if they had a chance to get up, they would destroy Gobekli Tepe. And that really bothers me. Yeah. But but just to put it in perspective, I think uh, they would have wandered into that area. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Schmidt, who was the lead archaeologist from the uh, German Institute of Archaeology, who oversaw the dig at Gobekli Tepe, he described in his feeling, he felt that back then, back 12, 14,000 years ago, that that region – would have been almost like a Garden of Eden. In other words, it would have been lush with uh, uh, fruit and, and berries and things because, remember, these are hunter-gatherers, and a wild game. And so it had been really a great place to live if you were a hunter-gatherer. You know, game was plentiful, and, and you could go out and pick a lot of berries and things like that. So it was a, it was a really very good place for them to live. And, uh, and, uh, but, and eventually, as I said, they multiplied probably and uh, had enough people to – to actually erect and build these uh, these structures that these four circles. Now, uh, Dr. Schmidt uh, said that uh, because they've done ground penetrating radar, that that there may be 16 more of these things down below, further down. He's only dug up since 1995. He said I've only I've only done about five percent of the dig. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done yet, and but he has uncovered uh-huh. these four enclosures so far. How could you hunt your uh, gatherers, uh, the Squintarian people, I guess you're alluding to, have uh, managed to move such huge stones? What do you think? Uh, that's a good question. How could the people that built the pyramid manage to move those stones, uh, 100,000 of them to boot, and make, make them so, so precise that you can't get your fingernail between them? You know? That's well, a good the, question. The ET people think they might have had some help from, uh, from extraterrestrials. That's possible. I mean, I wouldn't discount that. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And um, you know what? What's further down? And I'm, I'm anxious to find out what the next level down has. What happened? They said about eight thousand years ago. Uh, for some reason, they don't know why, but uh, the, the, the ruins that they've dug up, the four enclosures that they found, were, were buried, deliberately buried, about eight thousand years ago. So why was that? Well, uh, I have an idea. Yeah. Um, I so- show. A, I show a, a graph of the sea level in, in, in the region around Australia. In other words, some, someone got some data and plotted data on the sea level in that same region, uh-huh. you know, around the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, uh-huh. it, it goes, it starts off down like 
370 feet below our current sea level. And then uh, about 14,500 years ago or so, it makes this dramatic jump up. And it, it kind of stair steps up over uh, a period of uh, 14,000 years. And the first uh, width of the step, if you want to think of that way, was uh, yeah. a little over 3,000 years. Now, Sitchin thought that uh, the thing that caused the ice to, to begin to collapse, you know, that triggered it, was the near, clo- near approach of um, – of uh, Nibiru, from, you know, the gravitational effect of that. And if he was right, then every 3,600 years you'd get this, this stair step. Well, that isn't what I see. I see the first stair step occurring maybe after 3,000 years from the first one to the second one, and then uh, maybe 2,000 years for the next one and uh, so forth. And so the period between these stair steps and the magnitude of the stair step diminishes. And that is kind of what you'd probably expect if this was a natural process of uh, heating and melting of ice because the uh, the planet was warming up. There, there was a period in that region when, when the Earth was warming dramatically. And uh, so as uh-huh. the, the, the these huge ice uh, sheets are collapsing and marching toward the sea and collapsing, um, they the – the effect might might indeed diminish, and uh, maybe the the period between them would get closer together. If it had been the bureau, yeah. uh-huh. if they had been the bureau, they'd be about three thousand six hundred years apart. But I also did a calculation, assuming the bureau was even as large as uh, Jupiter, and assuming that the bureau's close approach was the asteroid belt, then uh, the gravitational effect from it would be like one sixth. Of, of the effect that that we have in the change from when the moon is closest to us from when the moon is farthest away. And I challenge yeah. people, I okay. say, oh, can you tell me right now, is the moon far or close? You know, We just don't detect that. And so I just don't okay. think yeah. that, that that's the cause. I think it was a natural cause um, due to due to the global warming, if you would, occurred back okay, then. Okay, so let me, let me, so let me summarize what, what I'm picking up because – uh, the um, tales that we get has condensed something that took place over a long period of uh, time, and it wasn't just a, a, an episode that was over in 120 days or something. And th- this time is recorded in the size of these uh, shelves. Well, that's quite ingenious, and I thank you. That's, that's yeah. really well, seems to astound for things. Well, uh, um, and the reason I started talking about that is you asked me. Or maybe I, I was I was talking about the fact that they deliberately buried this, this, these these temples eight thousand years ago, <laughs> and my my thought was well okay and if you look at this graph I just described uh, by the time we get to about eight thousand years ago uh, we actually things have quieted down in southern Mesopotamia you know they're no longer having these dramatic uh, mega tsunamis or tsunamis. And, it, and uh-huh. it's, uh, the, the sea level is kind of leveling out and, and getting back to normal. And uh, they had probably, the people had probably been warned, you know, don't go back there for now. It's unsafe, you know. And so at, at yes. about 8,000 years ago, it became safe to go down there. And meanwhile, they were migrating around that region, uh, you know, into Iran. And um, mm-hmm. at about 7,000 years ago, they <coughs> excuse me crossed back over. And refounded some of these ancient towns like Uruk, and uh, and then brought in agriculture. Right. So I'm thinking uh, maybe what they did is okay. Well, we're moving. Let's uh, let's uh, uh, abandon our temples. And we're going to build new temples. I don't know. <coughs> That's the only explanation I can That's come up with. Uh, well, one of the things that Hancock had mentioned uh, is that uh, the uh, Precision was causing a, a change in the alignment of the columns uh, toward different constellations, which supposedly pointed to the origin point of uh, the extraterrestrials, whom they regarded as, as gods. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so I you... wonder what you thought about the constellation lineup uh, uh, changing through time as being a, Hancock says that may be a factor in this uh, moving uh, when you could no longer just move the little stones around 
but you had to do a major alignment, and so you you bury the old one and start a new one. That's just an alternate hypothesis, anyway, about this the, yeah. the succession. But it, so yeah. usually in science, what I find when there's two hypotheses, <laughs> they yeah. each have some of the truth in them. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I I described the fact that I was curious how long uh, Nibiru would would be, you know, viewable, and and in my opinion, it, it's probably on the order of four years. Um, yeah, yeah. And it just so happens to happen to be four enclosures with uh, a slightly different alignment for each of the four, which would, I think, occur. And I, I, I guess I need to talk to an astronomer to actually or, or some kind of a simulation um, uh, program that would simulate exactly where uh, Nibiru would show, you know, one year and then a year later, would, where would it pop up out of the southern sky and then another year? Uh, someone have to, would have to do that analysis to, to kind of show that what I'm just saying is correct as to why the, the angle that these things are positioned and, uh, is, is off a little bit from, from one circle to the other. And, and that would yeah. also have to say that uh, can they build all, uh, one of these circles in, in uh, a year's time? I would imagine they could. You know, they're just a bunch of stones. Now, carving these, these, these stones – Maybe they had help from somebody who, who had the technology to do it. I don't know. I would. I don't want to speculate who that somebody might be, but probably they, they weren't Stone Age people. So, but what was it, were these uh, all stones, or was it uh, some um, chemically bonded uh, uh, cementing that they were doing, or some of each? I don't know. You know, um, I, unfortunately, I've never been there. Uh, and uh, uh-huh. I, I feel very, very lucky. If, I don't know how long you're going to stay here, but in uh, the first weekend of March, uh, Dr. Robert Schock, I don't know if you know of him. He's, he's a famous uh, – actually, he's a geologist, and uh, he's quite be- – became famous because he went into Egypt. Um, and um, at the time he, he, he visited Egypt, he, he went to the Sphinx, and, and they, he was told that the Sphinx is like, I don't know, 4,000, 4,500 years old. And as a geologist, he started looking at it and he says, no, actually, this is like, I think, over 10,000 years old. Well, he's putting, yeah. a, uh, he's putting a conference on in, uh, up here in, in Arizona, not too far from where we live, up in Sedona. And I'm, I've already signed up to go there, and I'll have a chance to talk to him because I have not been to go back to Tempe. And right now, I don't want to go there, but um, oh, yeah. you know, someday I'd like to go there. Uh, so I don't know. And, you know, I didn't even know – that those two, the major columns were painting, pointing south because most of the photographs I saw, they're, saw they're, they're T-shaped and, you know, and they have a t- the top of the T is generally pointing north and south. Well, are they looking north or are they looking south? And finally, I found a photograph where uh, clearly the front of this thing, because there's like a loincloth and hands coming around it, uh, I saw that in the picture, and then I looked at the shadows, and I said, well, it can't be p- pointing north because the shadows wouldn't be that way. It has to be pointing south. Now, probably people who have been there would say, oh, yeah, yeah, they are pointing south. But but I didn't know that until I saw the photograph. That's and I'm great. Saying, yeah. So uh, I said, well, and I know what Sitchin would have thought if he saw them pointing south. So that's that's what I say. Terrific. Thank you. That's, that's great. Well, wow. I, I'm anxious to talk to Dr. Schock because he's been there, and uh, you know I think he has his own views on the thing. Now, I think he would say that the thing that caused this collapse of ice sheets was that the sun uh, suddenly was spitting out a lot more energy than normal, and he thinks periodically it does that, and, and may have led to some extinctions in the past. I mean, well, you, you know that's that's entirely consistent with a, a large body. Um, that would affect the gravitational pull on the on the sun flares. They're not inconsistent. The two possibilities that it, uh, with the effects of Nibiru and effects of the of, of sun solar variations, you know. Um, well, maybe I don't know. I like I said, I I, I calculated the gravitational effect uh, on Earth from such a body, even if it was as large as Jupiter, because we, we, I don't know hardly sure anything. How. Well, yeah. not noticeable. I mean, if you had some kind of a gravity detector machine, you could probably say, "Oh, look at that needle! It's pointing. With some something's close by now." You know. Otherwise, how would you know? Because I've never, you know, I didn't didn't even know 
the, uh, I thought the moon was in a circular orbit. That's me, you know. And then I find out, no, it's not. It's, uh, sometimes it's farther away and sometimes it's closer. And so I, I found out what the two dimensions were and calculated uh, the gravitational effect of the moon close by and far by. And then I, I compared that to uh, what you would expect to see from um, Nibiru it, if it was uh, out in the asteroid belt and as big as is Jupiter, and I don't think it is. I, I think it's smaller than Jupiter. But, you know, I'm not even sure that the, the closest approach is at the asteroid belt. I, I'm surmising that. What if it is much closer than that? Then Yes, there, there, that's a really alternate uh, that thing that I've heard from uh, other researchers, that sometimes it uh, passes, indeed, between uh, Jupiter and Mars, but sometimes... It pa- the, the really disastrous times is when it passes between Mars and Earth, and uh, I've heard yeah. that from a, a few. Yeah, that that would be significant, uh, and I hope it isn't true, <laughs> because I can see I can see I, I don't want to be alive sixteen hundred years from now. That's true. <laughs> What do you think they're uh, taking pictures of when people are posting all these photos on Facebook of other bodies in the sky and two suns? And yeah, are you, are I, you tracking that? What do you think well, about you know, that? Well, you know, I believe um, I think it was Sitchin in his writing said that uh, it would cross the orbit of Mercury. In other words, it might you you would see it because. Um, because you know Mercury is closer to the sun than we are, and so if if you saw it coming across Mercury's orbit, uh, you might see it during the day, you know, and it would be it would appear to be close to the sun. And I've seen the pictures you're talking about, and I don't know what what that is. Right. Maybe, so everybody thinks yeah. that's Nibiru. And well, that, you know, uh, we're going to have a apocalypse. Or well, this is LaGrange yeah. debris. No, no, they're well. They don't look like uh, just debris. They look like, you know, planets, planetary yeah. systems. And sometimes they show pictures of more than one That's sphere. Right. That's right. So it yeah. doesn't it doesn't jive. It's really difficult to pin it down because it doesn't jive. Although if the beer is in the sky and we're seeing it, and it's supposed to be a cop- apocalypse, wouldn't we have it by now if it's visible like that? Well, uh, I think it was Nibir, uh, that uh, Sitchin in his description said uh, that it was so that Nibiru at, at some points was so bright it could be seen in daylight. So that's uh, interesting right. data. Uh, I don't know what to do with it, but that's interesting data. And I, I suspect if it did come very close, closer than the asteroid belt, uh, or if it was very large, you know, like as large as, as Jupiter, let's say. Uh, it would appear brighter than Jupiter, and maybe maybe you could see it during the day. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not an astronomer, um, so I don't know. Right. We don't know either. It's just a mystery. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure we'll find out so, someday. <laughs> maybe we, we'll regret it, but we'll find out. <laughs> what do you think about the where it says we're going to have uh, this, the uh, Earth stop and it'll groan and moan and uh, I heard a theory that it, once the Biru passes around our sun and starts to head back out of the solar system, it makes the planet stop. As an engineer, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I, it makes the planet do what? It makes the Earth stop, and it makes a loud moaning, groaning sound. And apparently that the, that the sound in the Earth stopping is recorded in Biblical times, it was what is it, a Joshua uh, blew the horn or something. Who, who blew Gideon, it? Gideon. No, Gideon. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they oh, down. oh, no, it's to blow down the walls of Jericho. Jericho, yeah. Yeah. So that apparently means uh, a long period of of daylight there, and then there's uh, stories on the opposite side of the earth at the same time. It was dark for a long period of time. Oh, oh I think she means it doesn't rotate, uh, earth doesn't rotate on its axis, and uh, Sitchin attributed this to a large. Uh, body uh, planetary or cometary uh, that uh, was recorded uh, when Joshua was uh, chasing the Amorites uh, and uh, and Leo uh, Yahweh told them yeah, don't, don't quit just at the regular time keep chasing them and you get to kill lots more and Yahweh was really into that oh, okay. whereas uh, 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 in Central America 
uh, the Maya were moaning that, gosh, it's been, it's 23 hours dark. This is really junk. And this happened in, in the same, in the, at the same time. And so that, uh, Sitchin takes this evidence that the world had, uh, Earth had stopped rotating on its axis. And I think that's what Janet's alluding to. Yeah. yeah that's kind of like the Earth's shifting crust hypothesis, where, where maybe the oh, crust, yeah. the crust stopped, uh, was shifting. Uh, uh, because I can't imagine that this, the huge amount of angular momentum of the entire Earth would be halted. I just can't visualize that. But uh, I believe Charles Hapgood's uh, hypothesis. Uh, even Einstein thought it made sense because he wrote the he wrote the um, forward to to Hapgood's book back in uh, 1953. Oh. I think it was. Um, so so Hapgood's uh, hypothesis was apparently credible. Uh, and because if you look at the Earth, the, the crust, which is in some places only about 40, I don't know what the average is, but maybe a few miles to 40 miles thick. Well, you put that in perspective and compare it to a radius of 4,000 miles. Whoa, and, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty thin. And if underneath, down, if you go down 40 miles, it may be that uh, whatever's down there is uh, – it's like a, a thick a tropic type of substance that, that when it's stressed it could be oh, sort of liquefy or something and and uh, mm-hmm. and suddenly and and of course Hapgood thought that the torque that caused the crust to shift was the buildup of the ice at the poles because it, it doesn't build up around the center if you look at the 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 map mm-hmm. of Antarctica uh, uh, and realize that the eastern edge is where the thicker ice is it's not at the center of rotation and so there's a torque being applied to the skin if you would of the earth and I think the same right. thing is true in the yes. earth. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, and, and of course, by the principles of, uh, of centrifugal motion, the uh, outside has to be going way faster than the inside. Uh, uh, the outside, what do you mean, the, uh, the Antarctica? The crust of the, the, uh, the, crust of the earth oh. uh, would not have the same speed as the interior. Uh, I don't know. Uh, or would it have I, the same speed? You're, you're well, it's all locked together. I, I, they uh-huh. would, to me, the Earth, uh, the outer crust uh, has the same uh, angular angular speed. In other words, so many degrees per day. You know, do 360 degrees in 24 hours type of thing. Uh, the the crust does that, and so does what's beneath. It's no, I don't think normally there's a slippage that constantly occurs. Uh, oh, that's what I wondered. Yeah, no. What you know, the continents do float a little bit, and they do move. Uh-huh. But, uh huh. But yeah, they 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 move from yeah. Pangaea to spread out uh, right over, over the uh, the Pacific Basin. Yeah, but that's a slow process. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, it's not happening. Real slow. Completely. Yeah, very slow. So, but I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting hypotheses. Uh, you know, how do you explain? Uh, finding um, animals in locations where they shouldn't be today, but because yeah. the, the, you know they're, they're normally like warm climates, and, and they they find their bones up in uh, I don't know uh, northern uh, Russia or someplace where it's cold. Yeah. Was how, how did that happen? And, and I guess supposedly they found uh, uh, animals that had uh, still had food in their mouth. They froze so quickly, and and I think that's where wow. Hapgood's hypothesis. A lot of people are thinking, you know, that makes sense that the, the, the crust shifted per, pretty rapidly. Now, I don't know if it happened, for, if it took a day for it to shift. And and I think the angle that he thought it shifted through was a matter of, I don't know, 80 degrees or something. So, oh. the, pole, so the pole changed, you know. Uh, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the 99.99% of the mass of the Earth was still rotating around the same axis. But the crust, the crust moved. Over that, so if you were standing on the crust, uh, right at the North Pole at the time it happened, all of a sudden you're not at, at the North Pole anymore, and the North Star is in a different location. But I would think that would be a pretty dramatic experience, you know, if if you're riding the crust as it's shifting. I'm sure there would be all kinds of things going on that wouldn't be good. Right. Wow. But, yeah, so, so, I, so what I'm getting from all these stories is lots and lots of stuff that may have taken place over long periods of time get condensed yeah. in the story as though they happen more rapidly. Yeah, and I don't know that the shifting crust thing relates to Noah's flood. 
I mean, I don't know that yeah. it doesn't, but I don't. I didn't follow that theme. Uh, uh-huh. I, I, I don't. I did. I do mention. I used to mention it in my lecture, but I don't think I put it into my book because I don't know that it's relevant to the story. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Wow, it's really great having an engineer like you look at this uh, stuff. You have you can have a certain precision of thought that a lot of us um, from the social sciences lack. Well, as uh, Spock would say, and he's my hero, uh, he would say it has to be logical. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, life is yeah, life it, is logical. It, it, life uh, follows a pattern that, that you, it, once you understand it, you can say, oh, yeah, that's logical. I should do that. The same thing with history. And, and you, yeah, you say that uh, you're, what, you, what you've studied sort of confirms the uh, the genetic statements about uh, that, that Sitchin uh, talks about about a hybrid race uh, that uh, was basically adapted to Earth. Yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, my take on it is um, um, the, the uh, Homo erectus was already there on the planet uh-huh. on Earth, and they they, they had uh, evolved to survive in uh, in Earth's climate and everything. They just weren't too smart, um, and I guess they didn't have the ability to talk. And it was Enki, the science officer, and Nintu, I think it was. I can't remember. You probably know. Um, it's, it's, together, yeah, Nima and Nindushita. Yeah, and, and they, Enki, so, son, yeah. The, they they're the Enki ones that that, 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 that they did the genetic yeah, engineering yeah. thing uh, that, that uh, created the hybrid, and and you know I think that's what's happening today with the hybrids. They're, they're, we're they're, we're being ratcheted up to uh, maybe a, a better being, maybe one who is more conscious of of life than the, the, than most it, of us exactly. are today. And you know this is a, a recurring theme in in, in uh, uh, breeding is uh, we call it hybrid vigor uh, and. Uh, the hybridization is where you uh, get both the, the lethals and the beneficials uh, as a result. And, of course, the lethals die out and the beneficials have more offspring. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading someplace about hybrids, and, and, it, and, and I discovered they said that uh, frequently the, the hybrid actually has the best properties of both. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know. Uh, because I'm thinking of a, of, a, of a mule, for instance, which is a hybrid. Yeah, right? yes. Yes. And oh, yes. Uh, a mule. mule. <laughs> that's right. And people like mules because they they can maybe do things better than a donkey or better than a horse. So they because they inherited uh, properties that make them better to do things. And uh, so I think the back uh, 250,000 years ago or whenever it was. Uh, when uh, Homo sapien was created out of Homo erectus, that uh, we inherited uh, some of the the better properties of uh, of the Anunnaki, maybe, uh, and some of the good properties as far as living on Earth from the Homo erectus. And uh, so, and we've continued to evolve, and and uh, but we're ready for the next level now. Maybe that's what's happening. Well, that's very fascinating. It's good to have other people look at the fiction material and, you know, come to different conclusions. What else would you like to say about, what is the name of that book again, uh, where you're looking at Noah's Flood? What, what is the name of the what? I'm sorry. Your book, that your book, The Science Behind Noah's Flood. Is that what it was called? Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's it. And, yeah. And I, we only have a, about... A, a little bit less than half an hour, and I want to cover some of your other books as well. So okay. what, else, what you'd like to conclude, is there anything else you want to add about the science behind Noah's Blood, and we'll switch to another book? Um, I can't, I'm sure there's other things, but uh, that, that, that we pretty much covered the major stuff. Uh, oh, well, yeah. I, already, I already told you about uh, the intersection of the, the, the nations of um, you know, Japheth, and uh, I thought that was interesting. And I, like I said, as I was writing that book, I just my mind kept getting blown. You know, I just wow. But uh, so I think I've covered the essence of it. Okay, great. Uh, you know, uh, the book that deals with anti-grav uh, propulsion, uh, field propulsion, and uh, why the uh, 
anti grav um, crafts making other sounds, and what is uh, what are heavy gravitons and uh, portals and stuff like that. I know you deal with all that, and it's a big mystery to most of us. Could you give us a little wrap about that? Uh, well, uh, right now that's a lecture that I gave. It's called The Science Behind uh, Gravitational Field Propulsion, and then the subtitle is uh, Key to Interstellar Travel. Uh, I don't really get into portals, but uh, uh, and, and by the way, I guess I need to preface all of this whole discussion with both my science fiction and my nonfiction. Um, since I retired from Penn State, I've been on this mission. It's not one I chose, but it seems to be the one that I'm supposed to be doing. And um, and that is to convince lay people uh, that certain things are true. For instance, that there are aliens, and there, and, uh, and so the lectures that I give, which eventually becomes uh, come books, are written. They're not academic books. They're written for lay people, and so are my lectures. They're they're given for lay people. They're very visual. They're PowerPoint lectures. But uh, so I, I I have been giving now for two years a lecture called. Uh, the, the science behind uh, gravitational field propulsion, key to interstellar travel, and um, as soon as I can fold in some of Swanson's work into that, uh, it, I'll make it into a book. But I, I have to do it at a level that uh, the layperson can understand. And so mm-hmm. all of my my lectures are that way. I, I don't invoke interdimensional travel. Um, I don't invoke wormholes. Uh, I use nuts and bolts science that uh, everybody who listens to my lectures, I hope, uh, and and um, would read my books would be able to understand. And so in the the, the book on uh, gravitational field propulsion, I, I, it'll be a book, but it's a lecture, I, I start off the lecture um, by uh, showing them how theoretically, uh, if you look at Einstein's equations, there is a connection between gravitational fields and electromagnetic fields. There's a simple equation, and I show them this side relates to gravity, and this side elect, uh, electromagnetic. And so Einstein was aware of that and kind of led him to uh, d- uh, believe that the light would be bent when it passed through a gravitational field, and it would bend starlight, and that was confirmed in 1919 by Sir Arthur Eddington at an expedition down off of Africa during a solar eclipse. So that was the first confirmation of Einstein's theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, then mm-hmm. from that, I, I, I then launch into some, uh, there was a book written by, I um, uh, can't remember his name now. He 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 wrote a textbook for, at Caltech. Uh, boy, let's skip that because I can't remember his name. But anyway, he wrote this book, and, and there's a whole chapter with a lot of math. And at the end of the chapter, um, uh, Richard Tolman, Richard Tolman. He, oh. he was he was on yeah. par. With, he was on par with Einstein as far as his brilliance. But so he wrote this book. Uh, it was uh, cosmology, um, relativity, and thermodynamics. I think was the title. But in chapter thirteen, I think he went through a development through you know mathematical development. Thing, and came, at the end of the chapter, he concludes that uh, light. Is more effect twice as effective, as a matter of fact, as uh, a particle in creating gravitational field. Um, oh. and that's, so that's in my lecture. And then I, I I pull off this paper I show it on the slide uh, of a paper that was published in uh, 2011 by a Canadian, and I don't recall his name, but um, he did some experiments where he suspended a mass in a controlled environment and shined a laser beam by it and noted that the mass moved toward the, the laser light, uh, indicating that the, the laser beam had a, a, one of its attributes, apparently, was a gravitational field. Um, then I talk about uh, uh, how some people have created a gravitational field through serendipity, and um, uh, you know they just were tinkering, and, and all of a sudden they were able to levitate things, uh, John Ciro, for instance, in England, who, he's still alive, but um, you know, in his Ciro magnetic machine, uh, it, it, not only does it run, it's like perpetual motion, not only does it run without putting energy into it, but it also creates a gravitational field. And uh, so wow. is, that, is that for real? You know, they might question if I was in the audience. Um, so then I talk about a, a, a paper that was presented by some Russians uh 
Tadmore and I don't remember the other gentleman, but it was a, a rush and it was published, peer reviewed, and I don't know if it was presented uh, at AIAA, but it was it was peer reviewed. Uh, they built an apparatus similar to the Zero, a magnetic machine, which is consists of a ring and some rollers. Pretty simple, but they had to be constructed a certain way. And what they built was uh, it, it weighed 750 pounds, and, and it was mounted on a platform that was supported by uh, some force transducers so it could measure the, the weight of everything. And they spun this thing up, and uh, once it got up to 200 RPM, they didn't have to put any more energy into it. And when it got up to 550 RPM, not only was it producing power all by itself, but it weighed the whole thing weighed 35 percent less. So wow, yeah. So um, when Pankletnov, and I'll talk about him later, did his experiments, he, he wrote a paper too, and it was uh, accepted, peer reviewed. But he reported a two percent uh, reduction in weight from his experiments, and he 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 said um, this apparatus apparently was shielding. Gravity. He didn't go so far to say he was creating gravity, but on the Tadmore experiment, this thing was running, and the whole system weighed 35% less. They then stopped wow. it and ran it in the other direction, and it weighed 35% more, indicating to me that they were actually generating a magnetic field. And this yeah. is where uh, the work that Claude Swanson has done and reported at the, the, this conference is interesting to me because maybe if I dig into that, maybe I can explain how this is actually creating a gravitational field because I can't right now. I'm just reporting results of an experiment. And and uh, so interesting things that, uh, for that Tadmore experiment, uh, they said that uh, as they walked away from the, this, this equipment and they had a thing that sensed the magnetic field, the measured magnetic field, that they would run into what they call walls, uh, maybe uh, three or six inches thick, I don't recall. Every every maybe 20 inches or so, there'd be this wall that was higher in magnetic strength. And it was also about 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. And then they keep walking. Oh. And it, it'd go back to normal, you know, and then they'd get to the, the next wall. And so imagine a bunch of cylinders concentric around the, this apparatus. And these walls, as they described it, went all the way up through the ceiling. They went in through the ceiling. And mm -hmm. so it, it could be that the reason uh, those walls were cooler is because they were extracting energy, the zero-point energy. And, and Claude kind of uh, was talking about something that in, when he was talking, uh, I, it, I said, well, maybe that's what was happening. You know? So I have to put all that together. You know, I just I just got home, so I haven't had a chance to read his book yet. But I'm really interested in it, and I think it's going to help me a lot in explaining some of these things. Well, okay, so then uh, I talk about all these experiments, and then I, I indicate that uh, I believe in what really got me onto this whole idea of gravity to begin with years ago when I when I concluded in my own mind that there, that there was life out there in the universe, t an intelligent life that had the capability to, 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 to travel through the galaxy and visit our planet, and those UFOs that people were seeing were real. And so how did they work? And looking at the data... In my mind, the only thing that, that could allow them to do what people report them doing is that they are propelled by gravitational field. They create a negative field, I believe. But they could probably do a pa positive, but they're lifted by a negative field, um, and the craft and the occupants are basically uh, free-falling either into or away from the field. In this case, if it's a negative field, they're free-falling away from it. Uh, and I, I give a thought experiment in my lecture. I, I have a picture of a V2 rocket, and I, I assign one, someone in the audience to go up in the nose cone, and I give them a cell phone, and I say, I'm going down here and light the fuse and stand back, and, and we're going to watch it take off. And then with the rocket's zooming up, and I say, what's going on? And he says, well, uh, I, I, I can hardly move my – the G meter says 4 Gs, and I can hardly move my hands. And then I'm watching, and all of a sudden the, the flame fizzles out, and so the rocket's coasting. And I say, well, now what's happening? And, and the, the, the person reports, uh, well, my G-meter says zero, and I'm tending to float uh, out of my couch. Good thing I'm strapped in. So now, now all of a sudden I'm looking, and he's falling. 
And I say, well, now what's happening? He says, well, nothing's changed. And my G meter says zero, and I'm floating. And I said, but you're accelerating at 1G. And then let's repeat this experiment over Jupiter. You'd be accelerating at maybe 40 Gs, but you have no mm -hmm. sensation of it. You're free falling. I think Claude mentioned that in his lecture, too. But that's it. If you have gravitational field propulsion, you can accelerate at any rate you want, 1,000 Gs, whatever. And I show a graph in my lecture, if you could build a UFO that accelerates at 100 Gs, and they have been clocked at, at 100 G accelerations, by the way, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. then you could get to the moon in 20 minutes. You could get to Mars in 12 hours, so you wouldn't worry about the effects of zero gravity on people because you're going to go there in 12 hours, and you go to Jupiter in 18 hours, and that's just at 100 Gs. And, uh, and I show a curve, and I say, okay, I'm going to put you in this craft, and we're going to send you off, and after uh, at 100 Gs, after uh, a year, we call you up, and we, we say, congratulations, you're out one light year. You've gone a light year. Uh, that, that's the distance, and, and it only took you a year to do that. And uh, the, the documents say, well, actually, according to our calendar, it's only been 19 days because of time dilation. By now, you're traveling so fast that you have time dilation. And I say, okay, well, uh, are you happy? Are you still comfortable and everything? And they say, sure, well, we'll keep going. And so pretty soon after, uh, they get out about 40 light years out, um, they decide, well, you know, let's turn around and go home. So they do. And they come back. And guess what? When they land, the, the Earth has moved ahead in time 80 years because they just did time travel. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. wow. So that's that's kind of my lecture. And my, my, my whole point in giving that lecture to people is that they realize that, that uh, UFOs can do these things people see them doing. They, they can travel uh, several thousand miles an hour without any uh, shockwave because the reason we have shockwaves is as an aircraft is moving forward, pressure builds up in front of the craft. And uh, that warns the molecules ahead of it to start moving out of the way. And that signal, if you want to call it that, is limited to the speed of sound. And once you reach mm -hmm. that speed, then these molecules crash into you and you have a shock wave. But if you could forewarn them to get out of the way by something that travels at, at faster than the speed of light, actually, the gravitational field that you just created, the negative one, they move out of the way and you don't have a shock wave. Then there's so you the question. Carry your tunnel, you, ca you carry your tunnel with you. Yeah. You know, that that is the really spooky thing. I mean, it's like uh, this whole concept of gravitational field propulsion. You know, you, you create this gravitational field and, and off you go. Well, that's kind of like grabbing yourself by the seat of your pants and lifting yourself off the floor, in my opinion. <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to visualize, but apparently that's what happens. Um, because they do it. And uh, there's other things that people see UFOs do that I explain using just everyday science or experiments that scientists have done, um, like how they cloak themselves. Uh, a strong magnetic field will do that, by the way. Um, and there uh, well, is what, evidence. One of the, one of the things that uh, I, I think I, I, it's, they say just before a, a UFO uh, gets out of sight, there's a place where it's transparent, and an airplane flying above the UFO sees through the transparent sort of outline of the craft down to the trucks and uh, aircraft and runways below. I, I, and it, it seems like there's a, a, a wink in and wink out uh, from the observer on Earth anyway. Well, that's interesting. I, mean, I haven't heard that, but <clears throat> I visualize um this magnetic field, uh, Dr. Erber um, from the University of Chicago, I believe it was, <clears throat> excuse me, he may have retired now. He wrote a paper in 1962 that was published at the British uh, Journal of Nature. <clears throat> and, and excuse me, he, he was uh, studying the, the uh, velocity of light as it passed through magnetic fields and reported uh -huh. the results in terms of uh, index of refraction. And, he, and you can take his equation uh, and graph it, and I did, and I have that in my lecture and it shows that if you can develop a strong enough uh, gravitational field, the index of refraction goes way beyond two, and it, it kind of oh. just bends, bends light all over the place. So if you imagine you had a very powerful magnetic field around you, the light from behind you bends around you and comes out to the observer, and they don't see you. 
they see, you know, it's like you're not there. They, they see right around you. You're, Yes, 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 yes. Right. I was and sitting in my living room. And I just let me ask you about this, and then go back to that. I was sitting in my living room about a month ago, and I have a picture window that looks toward Haleakala and Science City. And right in broad daylight, clear sky, I see a uh, craft, and it kind of twists and turns, and 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 then ends up like out of out of just the air. It looks like it was twisting and turning, and then it went straight. And it gave me a sideways view, like a car parking, about 30 feet outside my window. It was about the size of a car. And it, yeah. it stayed there long enough for me to talk to my girls and say, wow, there's a spacecraft right here, and it's showing itself to me. And then it did a twist and turn. Um, and it's like it was bending time and space. It, it disappeared like a twist turn, but into the sky itself. It, it didn't come from behind a cloud. It, it didn't. Zoom in front of me, back. So it seemed like it was going through dimensions, but it, it was it, when yeah. it came in, when it came out, it twisted and turned, like it was going through maybe a portal or something. It was very strange. Yeah, I don't know if that uh, yeah. makes sense. Hard to explain, yeah. but. Yeah, I, I don't quite visualize it, but I mean, uh, if, if they can cloak themselves and, and appear to like a, a lens type of thing, <clears throat> then you know maybe that would have the same effect. Um, and. The, the, by the way, the, this, this data that uh, Dr. Erber developed uh, indicated that the effect of the bending of the light, if, if you would, the, the effect is, is, a, is also uh, dependent upon the wavelength of the light. And so I, I show a, two, a graph that has two, two curves on it. One curve is uh, infrared light, and the other is uh, sodium light, which is basically the wavelength that we see with our eyes normally. Oh. And, and on this graph, uh, uh, the, the horizontal graph is uh, <clears throat> the amount of distortion that's equivalent to what you would see uh, on a highway that's heated 100 degrees. You know how you see things distort, uh, you, oh, know, yeah. on a hot, hot, you know, on a hot pavement. Uh, so I kind of related it to that. And and I showed on the graph. I said, well, uh, the infrared on the infrared curve to, to get the same distortion on the infrared curve takes uh, I can't remember now. I think four times as uh, high a, a uh, uh, magnetic field, you know, strength-wise, as as the magnetic field for visible light, and mm -hmm. um, so uh, so then I relate that. If you recall, in 2004, uh, there was this headline news all around the world. The the Mexican government, Air Force, no less, reports that they actually filmed UFOs. You, you remember that probably? And, oh um, yes. Yeah. So these the plane it was a plane that was I guess had the infrared uh, cameras to, to track drug smugglers you know looking for the heat and so like as I understand the the guy who was monitoring the <coughs> the, um, the screen saw these these uh, balls of light you would you might say uh, on the uh, blips on the screen and he looked over in the direction that the camera was pointed out of the plane and he didn't see anything <clears throat> but but he could clearly see them in infrared. Um, so what, and I, so I explained that. I said, well, <clears throat> obviously, uh, they, uh, it was easier to cloak themselves in visible light, as, as I showed on the graph, than it was in infrared. So we could see them in infrared because they, they didn't have a sufficient magnetic field, let's say, to do it. But in, in visible mm -hmm. light, we couldn't see them. So, so that's wow. one of the things I talk about. Uh, also talk uh -huh. about how they freeze ponds. You know, if you've heard stories where <clears throat> they've been hovering over a shallow body of water, and then they they leave, and and, and the, the, that is all frozen or very cold, but usually frozen. And I explain that, and I say, well, okay, this he, this UFO is hovering over this shallow body of water. He's hovering. He didn't land. He's just hovering. Underneath them is this uh, anti gravity, negative gravitational field, expelling everything from underneath. They're creating a very low pressure region because everything's being expelled. So the water is evaporating very quickly, and w evaporation is a process where molecules leave that and, and take heat with them. And so the body of water that's left behind is getting colder and colder and colder as this heat's being extracted. It's it's called uh, uh, like a swamp cooler. It's what it is. Same idea, evaporative cooler. And that eventually, if he's there long enough, and then the water is shallow enough, it would freeze. And that's because of the negative gravity field underneath the craft. So those, so that's Terrific. basically what I get into my in that lecture. <clears throat> yeah. So your hypothesis can um, account for several 
mysterious freezings uh, yeah. that are associated with these kind of craft. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, when people see a UFO and they say all of a sudden it disappeared and it's over here. Uh, and they, they think, well, it's interdimensional. And, again, I, you know, you got to realize the audience I'm trying to convince here, if I said interdimensional, I might lose them. But if I say, well, guess what? It can accelerate at any rate it wants, a 1,000 Gs. Can you imagine how quickly it can move from point A to point B if it could accelerate at 1,000 Gs and then decelerate wow. at 1,000 Gs? So it may be just a matter of it's just moving very quickly, so fast that you, your your eye didn't, doesn't detect it. You know, when you watch a movie film, what, what is it? How many frames? 16 frames a, a second or something? It makes you think it's a continuous motion. Is that I can't remember the number. <laughs> yeah. So so maybe yeah. your eye yeah. does not register the actual transporting of the craft from point A to point B because it, it's so fast. I mean, that's one explanation. I don't know. Maybe they are, Maybe it is interdimensional, but I have to stay away from those things. You know, my audience, I don't want to lose them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, these folks you have, what were they called? The, um, what are they called? The three, bo- the three, the three book series? Oh, the, 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 uh, the science log, fiction. One, two, and three. Yeah. Alien science Log, fiction. yeah. We only have uh, a couple minutes left. I wanted to touch on those. What okay. Is, what are they, why are they called Alien Log? What, what's behind the story? What's okay. the Alien Log mean? The, okay, that's a good question. Um, why do they call it Alien Log? Well, uh, the story starts off with a UFO that crashes in Kingman, Arizona in 1953. In uh, May, it was discovered in May 20th, 1953. And I, I remember those dates. But, but uh, the Army captain who was overseeing the recovery of the craft found this artifact next to the UFO and he hid it on his person. And so now we come to present time and, and he's retired. He's dying of cancer and obviously he's followed the UFO scene because he knows they exist. And he's alarmed because people who have been abducted report under hypnosis that the aliens have said they're about to make their presence known. And being military type, he sees that as a threat. He takes the artifact to the President of the United States, who is also alarmed, and commissions a colonel to put together a team of scientists to activate the device to see if we can find out what's going on, you know, uh, maybe even tap into their mainframe or something. But the reason it's called, the book is called Alien Log is because the captain thought it might be the log, some kind of electronic version of a log for the ship. And that's why it's oh. Alien Log. And so there's three books. What yeah. are the subtitles of three books? Uh, the subtitle Log is the first one. Yeah. yeah. The second one is uh, the subtitle is The New World Order. And in that book, uh, Corey, one of the main characters, he's an astrophysicist, accidentally gets abducted. And Quellen, the alien, is embarrassed, of course. Uh, but so before he lets him go, they have some conversation, and he'll answer any question Corey asks. And one of them is, "Why are you creating hybrids?" And uh, Quellen says, "Well, we're creating them to usher in the new world order." And now this new world order is really a new world government, and it, it's a government that will not happen with uh, the, with people the way they are today because they're all too self-serving. So the the hybrids tend to be. Uh, uh, they, they have certain capabilities. They're very bright. Uh, they have some uh, ability to do some a certain amount of telepathy. So they can actually uh, manipulate people to some extent, or, or at least they end up in high positions because of their capabilities. But also they have this characteristic that they're not self-serving. They really are very interested in humanity. They're loving people, and they're the ones who will make the decisions. Oh, that's- Robert, I'm, I'm afraid to inter- we're running out of yeah. time. Could you please tell our listeners how to reach you? Uh, <laughs> website. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, uh, just go to Amazon and get my books. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.